Good morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this session on introducing climate risk scenarios organized by the IAA Climate Risk Task Force. Today, I will be both moderator and speaker. I am Micheline Dion from Canada, co-author of this paper and chair of the IAA Climate Risk and of the IAA Resource and Environment Task Forces. We also have Philip Keller from Switzerland, co-author of this paper, PhD in math, member of the L'Association Suisse des Actuaires, and active contributor to the Insurance Regulatory Front. Lastly, but not least, we have Raid Muslin, member of the IAA Climate Risk and vice chair of the IAA Resource and Environment Task Force. Raid is actively working on climate risk mandates in Australia and in many other places. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the Climate Risk Initiative is a strategic initiative of the IAA and has been launched in May 2020. Its purpose is to increase awareness of the potential impacts of climate related risk on financial risk management reporting and disclosure, and to increase recognition for the potential contribution of actuaries as risk experts on the part of uh, supranational organization, government agencies, industry and the public, and of course the actuaries themselves. And this is done through the development of the actual profession skill set by publishing a series of papers that build on each another. The first paper has already been published, The Importance of Climate-Related Risk for Actuaries. This paper is meant to increase the awareness of actuaries as to how climate risk affects all aspects of their work and how their training on risk management prepares them to consider and assess that risk. Next slide, please. This webinar covers the second paper of the series and more papers are expected in the coming years. So just to have a sense of what's coming up and, and that's so what's not in this paper. So first paper is a paper on uh, application of climate related risk scenarios to financial institution insurance and pension risk. And by our colleague Ray that will be a presenter today and to be published later this year, hopefully in Q. We'll have a paper focusing on asset portfolios, risk and in investment later in 2021. And in the, in the following years, we expect to publish paper on financial risk management, reporting and disclosure along the lines of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Recommendations. The TCFD, by the way, has been created by the Financial Stability Board. Another paper on transition and adaptation risk. I say one paper, but it may be two because these are big topics. And finally, a, a paper on the link between climate related risk scenarios and social security. We've kept this one for last as it will include projection of population, GDPs, migration, agricultural capabilities and economic environment. And no doubt a very complex uh, modeling and complex paper. Uh, in the meantime, the IAA uh, intends to review its existing publication to update them for climate related risk. Before we go further, I would like to recognize the authors of this paper. In addition to Philip and I presenting today, there was Lubna Benkirain from the UK, member of the IFOA and of l'Institut des Actuaires de France, who provided her insight into the practical aspect of climate related risk scenario making. I also want to recognize the major contribution of Yves Gerard, member of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries and PhD for his extensive research and enthusiastic writing. Many thanks to both. Next slide, please. Oops. No. Uh, Yes, yes, correct. Thanks. Um, in this paper, we want to recognize that the actuaries have long played vital roles in managing financial risk. 
that there is a growing recon global recognition of the importance of climate related risk. We want to recognize the importance of the international inter sorry intergovernmental panel on climate change as a source of basic research information. That scenarios analysis is an important tool to assess, monitor and report financial impacts. That climate related risks are complex and carry a high degree of uncertainty. That interactions between risks uh, that are not, are not linear, indeed, there are many feedback loops and tipping points. That a wide range of potential scenarios is best suited to express the uncertainty of the climate related risk and to recognize that actuaries may need to work in multidisciplinary teams to develop scenarios. Next slide. This paper is organized to first introduce where the basic and reliable information can be found. It then describes the various climate related risk and opportunities, reviews the approach to risk analysis from simple ones to more complex one, and then provide a view of the process criteria and analysis to create scenarios. It concludes with a review of the key challenges and the expected work of the IAA. At this point, I'd like to uh, invite Philip to uh, to uh, to take to take the mic. Thank you very much, Micheline. So uh, I will give a, a short overview of what the, the current state of climate change and a, a high level introduction, uh, in particular to scenarios and physical risk and, and rate afterwards, we go into more detail on that. So climate change uh, is defined as the change in average uh, temperature and, and variability of the climate system. And it is not the same as the weather, which is more a short-term effect and short-term variations. So you can still have cold snows like in Texas, uh, but you can still also have climate change is the difference. And next slide, please. Uh, to, to see somewhat the, the state of climate change, uh, the figure on the left shows uh, the CO2 concentration uh, since during the last 800,000 years, which has been measured using different approaches. And if you look on the right, the red line, which goes up nearly vertically, uh, is the, the change and the increase in CO2 concentration since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, to, to put it in another way, uh, it, it has never been as high as currently as as during the last 3 million years. It was as high uh, during the Pliocene about 3 million years ago, where incidentally the sea level was about 30, million, uh, 30 meters higher than, than it is currently. So the, the current uh, concentration is, is about 417 ppm. Uh, the, the CO2 emission comes from different reasons. It's basically from burning of fossil fuels. Uh, it comes from industry in a large part, from buildings and the heating and construction. Uh, it's quite a strong contribution from transportation and also from agriculture, uh, both from crop burning uh, soils, but also by having less parts of the environment which can capture CO2. Uh, on, the, on the right, you see the, the contribution of different parts of the world uh, aggregated since uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750. So uh, in total, the estimate is that about 1.6 trillion tons of CO2 have been emitted by, by humans, uh, mostly by Europe, uh, Asia and North America. But of course, if you look at it by, on a cap per capita basis, it's, it's Europe and North America, which emitted the most uh, during this last 270 years. Next slide, please. Yeah. When, when looking at, at climate change and the, the organization on how to deal around it and the Paris Agreement, there are, uh, of course, a lot of bodies involved and a lot of acronyms. And the following two slides uh, just uh, give a, a very short introduction to these bodies and abbreviations. So the, 
The Paris Agreement is a treaty between the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it is a part of a series of, of those treaties. It started with the UNFCCC, and then there was the Kyoto Protocol in 2005, and the Paris Agreement, which is in force since 2016. Um, uh, signatory nations, which are more or less each and every country in the world, uh, commit to nationally determined contributions called NDC, which are uh, basically promises to take actions such that the Paris Agreement goals can be achieved. Uh, these NDCs are updated every five years, and they are supposed to get more ambitious over time. Um, compliance to these nationally determined contributions uh, are not legally binding, but reporting on them is. And um, if one does not adhere to these NDCs, uh, they're supposed to be a naming and shaming. And national performance can, for instance, be tracked by the Climate Change Performance Index and also by other indices. And the current laggards uh, in 2020 are the US, Saudi Arabia, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Iran, Australia, and Canada. And so some of the highest emitters, actually. Uh, a, a very important uh, part of this organization is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, they basically collect, assess, and curate all research that is globally being done on climate change. And they publish uh, frequently assessment reports which give the new state of research and observations on climate change. These are called the assessment reports. And next slide, please. And, and this is just a, uh, a graphical representation on how these organizations, organizations uh, fit together. Uh, important also for actuaries are these assessment reports, which give a uh, uh, the, the latest view on the science and, and the data on climate change and the RCPs, these are the representative concentration pathways, which are in the next slide. The next slide, please. Yeah. The representative uh, concentration pathways describe uh, different climate change scenarios that uh, the IPCC considers. And they are labeled according to the assumed radiative forcing values, which means the, the difference between the solar influx, so sunlight onto the earth, and the radiated heat expressed in watt per square meters. And the, there are four relevant major ones. It's a, the range from RPC 2.6 with the low radiative forcing uh, up to RPC 8.6. So RPC 2.6 is a very aspirational pathway where CO2 emissions are declining already now and will go to zero by the year 2100. And it assumes a negative emissions via carbon capture and storage. RPC 4.5 is the intermediate scenario where emissions are peaking in 2040. And RPC 6.0 is a more pessimistic one where the emissions will peak only in 2080. Uh, RPC 2.6 up to 6.0 all assume uh, that new technology will help uh, a conversion to a, a carbon-free economy and industry. And the, the most extreme one is RPC 8.6, which is a business as usual, high emission. Uh, we continue to do as we do now, uh, but it's actually not the worst case scenario. This, this representative concentration pathways, of course, also have assumptions on the global warming. So the, the optimistic RPC 2.6 assumes that the global warming will be limited to about 1.5 degrees overall, whereas RPC 4.5 assumes a warming of 2 to 3 degrees globally, and RPC 8.5 is an extreme one where, and of course, it's very difficult to calculate uh, the global increase in temperature is, is assumed to be between three and 12 degrees up to the year 2300. So RPC 8.6, where we do nothing, is quite extreme. Now the next slide, please. And obviously, climate change is highly complex to, to calculate and assess. 
because it evolves over decades and even centuries and it impacts many different domains, not just the environment, but also our societies, uh, the economy. It will impact politics, uh, technology, as well as law and regulations. And it already does uh, to a certain degree. So uh, one cannot expect from us actuaries uh, to, to predict how climate change will impact the balance sheet of an insurer. Uh, nevertheless, we have to make assessments on how this might happen. And, and uh, we have to assess the impact of the climate, cha climate change on, on the balance sheets of insurers, the effect, especially on long duration liabilities like uh, life insurance. And we also already now have to price climate related risk in certain ways. And, and while this is complex, it is nevertheless possible to formulate scenar scenarios that together uh, if one has several uh, scenarios, capture the possible futures and help to illuminate uh, how climate change might be and how it might impact us. And, and the scenario is def defined by the IAE uh, as, a, as a possible future environment, either at the point in time or over a period of time. And it's a projection of the effects of a scenario over time uh, can be studied and can illuminate uh, certain aspects on how firms or entire industries are impacted on. And rate will go into more details on how that can be done for climate change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, what is important is, is the complexity of climate change forces actuaries uh, not to do it on their own, but to work in interdiscipl interdisciplinary teams. Um, because analyze the impact of climate change on a, on a clearly de delineated domain like the environment, uh, it might be sufficient to, to consult with biologists or environmentalists, but to assess the impact on different domains and how they are interlinked, uh, it is necessary to work in interdisciplinary teams to combine the knowledge uh, of generalists, but also of specialists. Uh, and it, it's really an important point, and the paper also stresses this. And there are many different effects of climate change uh, on these different domains. Uh, there are just five examples here. Cumulative effects are incremental impacts that add up over time. The best example is, of course, the burning of fossil fuels, which incrementally increase the CO2 concentration. There are cascades where one effect triggers another. The current pandemic is a wonderful example uh, where we can observe that where an initial pandemic uh, impacted supply chains, the financial market, and the society as a whole. There are ripple effects that propagate and impact other risk factors, possibly across different domains. There are also tipping points, especially in climate change, where a small change can qualitatively alter the state or the development of a system. For instance, if the, if the water temperature reaches a certain level, certain fishes will just suddenly all die. And, and finally, there are feedback loops, loops where effects which can dampen or strengthen the initial driver. So the negative or positive feedback loops, a positive feedback loop might be the release of permafrost, which releases more CO2, which increases the temperature, which increases the, the emission of CO2 and, and other greenhouse gases. So it's, it's highly complex, but very interesting for an actuary and a mathematician. The next slide, please. Um, so there are two different types uh, with which the paper deals, uh, physical risks and transition risks. And the physical risks are the risks that uh, result from climate change that can be event-driven, acute, or long, longer term, chronic, from shifts in climate patterns. And physical risks and impact insurers in different ways, directly, for instance, by damaging the assets, for instance, the buildings of insurers, the destruction of physical infrastructure by storms or heat waves. Uh, it can impact the liabilities, uh, can be uh, higher climbs due to catastrophes, which will be more, uh, more powerful hurricanes, uh, more devastating heat waves, floodings, or health impacts on the population by the heat. It can impact via the assets where 
potentially catastrophes affect financial markets. Or, um, you have more default due to climate change related impacts on the economy. And it also can impact both assets and liabilities uh, via possibly changing weather patterns, again, catastrophes, or by large scale governmental construction programs and increased uh, governmental and national debts, which have an impact on interest rates, which impact, of course, uh, both assets and liabilities. And next slide, please. And just quickly, and, and Ray will go in more detail here, is uh, that to formulate the scenario, one also has to look at the region where an insurer is, is mainly exposed to. And one starts with a, a representative concentration pathway, which can be expanded to a more granular description of a possible global climate change scenario. Then that global scenario has to be specified for the region under consideration because climate change does not impact each region of the globe uh, in the same way. Uh, it can be more extreme, like uh, the Arctic. Uh, the warming is, is twice as high as in, in other regions. And some regions might benefit from climate change, but many others uh, will uh, suffer from it. And finally, once the regional scenario has been specified, one can then look at the impact on the different domains, like uh, technology, society, uh, the environment, and, and other things, uh, which might be relevant uh, to assess the impact on the exposures in the balance sheet of the insurer. The next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, insurers or actuaries have to consider uh, the environment they're in. Uh, Claims experience might really differ depending also on the measures that uh, jurisdictions take where the exposures are situated. Building codes uh, can have a big impact. Uh, uh, if a government or a nation uh, prepares infrastructure for the, for the coming uh, warmer world, uh, mandatory participation in, in, in pools related to climate change, all this can have a, a big impact on the exposures and the claims experience of insurers. And it's also important to mention here, it's not just insurers, but also pension funds and other financial institutions where actuaries work. And it's, for instance, our pension funds are obviously exposed to climate change via the assets, but also via the health of their pensioners. Uh, we just need to think back at the heat wave of Europe in 2003, where about 30,000 uh, people died, uh, extra death, about 14,000 uh, in France alone. And, and these heat waves are assumed to become stronger and, and more severe. Another example would be Qatar, where uh, more than 6,500 workers, which work on the stadium for, the, for this uh, soccer world championship, have already died because of heat and dehydration. And, one can sadly expect this to happen more in the future. And pension funds and insurers have already started to take this into consideration. The next slide, please, which is my last one. Um, of course, one very important work that actuaries do in, in insurers and pensions uh, is the pricing of risk. Uh, by putting a proper price on the risk, one can also uh, steer where the exposures will be and how people, uh, policyholders and companies behave. Uh, insurers can make it cheaper to insure a certain exposure uh, if the policyholder has taken into account climate risks and take proper measures, or they can make it more expensive or impossible to insure certain risks where, uh, for instance, a policyholder or a company or an entire nation has not done uh, proper uh, measures against climate related risks. And another very important part is the proper accounting of externalities. It's uh, <coughs> companies that emit uh, greenhouse gases and cause environmental degradation currently do not really have to reflect that properly in most accounting systems. Uh, this is uh, consequences of these greenhouse gas emissions 
are basically currently uh, the problem of future generations and uh, companies can make profit and the losses will accrue only in, in later years and will not have to pay for it. Uh, of course, insurers and, and actuaries cannot by themselves correct the lack of proper costing uh, for these externalities. However, actuaries can contribute in the development of a proper valuation reporting system that would take into account all relevant costs, uh, in particular those relating to climate change, so that not just uh, future generations have to be burdened with the costs that we actually cause. And, and with that, I give over to Raid. If you don't mind, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to take over, uh, Philip. Uh, um, so, uh, wait, next slide, please. Hi. Uh, up to now, I guess we focused on uh, our attention on physical risk, global warming, rising sea level, drought, fires, severe storm, but their ultimate impact will not be reached before a few decades. In the meantime, hopefully we will attempt to reduce the final impact through various means. And the means that we are likely to take will have its own impact, its own risk. Risks that are likely to be felt in advance of the physical risk, and these risks are called transition risk. There are three main types of transition risk. First, policy risk. These are coming from the policy action taken by government to slow down climate warming. What we are referring here are things like carbon pricing, mandating the use of electric car by sale 2030, stopping to subsidize uh, investment in certain sources of energy and subsidizing uh, other sources. Then there's a technology risk. There's always been risk with new technology, but the new transformation will likely depend a lot on the te new technology that may promise more than it can or that will come with undesirable side effects that could generate more disadvantage than benefits. Electric cars do not use fossil fuels, but their batteries may be quite damaging for the environment. And there's also the possibility that an even better way of traveling is invented. Or perhaps future travel will be mostly virtual. Who knows? There are also market risk. The habits will be changing. The pandemic's already highlighted areas of improvement. Demands for more local products, better production means, more durable goods, better use of agri agricultural soils, better industry process, all requested by the consumer. This, these risks are likely to materialize earlier as they are triggered years in advance of the physical risk. Hence, they are the first risk to be modeled and their effectiveness will impact the severity of the ultimate physical risk. The strength of the transition will vary by region. It will vary according to the specific country commitments into the Paris Agreement and how firm that commitment ends up to be. It will depend on local reliance on fossil fuels and on the intensity of the mitigation efforts accelerating or not the recognition of what needs to be done. Next slide, please. Most projection scenarios are done relative to a local environment, the region that the in financial institution, government or industry organization operates in. In certain countries, fossil fuels are an important source of revenue and political power and transitioning away from it will be more difficult to envisage and achieve. Developing countries are likely to resent sacrificing return while developed countries were able to take advantage of such source of energy. There will be different jobs available, but it will be more difficult to older employees to recycle into the new practice area. Even if the focus is regional, no region, no region is isolated from the other ones. There is no wall to restrain air pollution to spread and the sea level will rise equally, whatever the source of the warming is. One clear outcome of transition risk is the reduction in value of some assets that are losing their attractiveness. Regarding fossil fuels, there's some indication that 
60 to 80 percent of known reserve may never be used, replaced by water, wind, or solar source of energy. And this will impact not only the oil producer, but all industries heavily dependent on it. The ships that carry fossil fuels across oceans, the machine that use fossil fuels as their energy source. Other assets will also be affected, like cities abandoned due to rising sea level or farmlands replaced by deserts. Of course, the uh, sorry, of course, the reserve also be cities will be uh, may get better access to water as it rises in wetlands could be farmed. But so, but that's not losing value there. Uh, call what, what normally called stranded assets. So if you hear that term, that's that's what it means. Okay, I'm hearing the sound is not so good. Um, I don't know if I should maybe uh, take my camera off. Just let, let I'll see, I'll try, let's try again. Ne next, next slide. Ah, I'm hearing I'm, I'm getting better. That's the, the sound is getting better than me, the sound. Okay. Um, the last category of risk related to climate is the legal and reputational risk category. The risk here is that one would be sued or lose its reputation for having failed to mitigate or adapt and hence let the climate risk get bigger or expose others due to negligence or lack of foresight, whether it's oil spill, nuclear accident, chemical spills. Was the risk taken into consideration? Is it clearly, uh, was, it, uh, was it its impact clearly reported and mitigation and adaptation means identified? Were the financial disclosure intended to give a greener picture than warranted? The number of climate legal case is already significant and keep growing. The reputation cases may be as costly as the legal ones. The judgment is done by the public rather than the court, but it's done anyway and can be harder to be protected against. At least for the court cases, there can be an error in emission protection from insurance companies. Next slide. There are different ways to get at a sense of the, the sensitivity to climate related risk. Ideally, you may want to start with a simple approach that would help you visu visualize the level of risk without going necessarily into scenarios. With the frozen balance sheet approach, you can get a sense of the underlying risk by using a static view of risk by time buckets for both your assets and liabilities. This could also help comparing two portfolios or two companies by telling how much of your assets and liabilities are at risk and how long is the risk. If you want a more dynamic picture that will respond to scenarios, you may want to use what if scenarios and focus on some variables to start with using the variable most sensitive to climate risk. From there, you can refine scenarios and include more variables to get to a more solid long-term analysis. It is useful to get a comprehensive view. Resource available versus needed, population size, inequalities, mitigation, adaptation. As the model gets more sophisticated, the actuary may need outside help from, for example, climate scientists, economists to get economic growth, inflation, engineers to inform on technological advance, its benefits and risk, demographists to forecast population growth and migration, and doctors for health impact, just to name a few. As projections go further in the future, discounting from a distant future will bring a few challenges. Is it okay to discount to small number a catastrophe simply because it's so far in the future? The current discounting methods implicitly assumes that there are viable options to compare to. But will there really be viable options in some of the most extreme scenarios? In such a case, you may want to do social discounting and use a lower rate than what you would use otherwise. In any case, you need to assess whether your discounting approach is appropriate. Next 
Now, let's dive deeper into scenario making on the RAF, uh, on the RAID, sorry, on the RAID guidance. RAID, it's yours. Thank you very much. And uh, it, it's great to be with you today. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize that I think most actuaries understand well, but it's often confusing when we talk about the TCFD, is that whenever we use the term risk as actuaries, we, we should be thinking about both the downside risk of bad things happening and the upside risk of opportunities. Um, because it's a, it's a two it's a two sided distribution. There's 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 a range of outcomes for every everything we've talked about, which can benefit a firm or a country or can hurt a country or firm. And and in the TCFD, they do make a significant distinction between risks and opportunities. And and I think it's important that in general, when actuaries talk about risk, we think about it as 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 both risk and opportunity. So, so I guess the first question is, why do you conduct a scenario analysis? And, 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 I, and I think that's, it's, it's a thought exercise to understand your exposure to climate risks, both now and in the future. And the TCFD requires disclosure and you, you need to basically disclose in a manner which allows you to benchmark your risk profile against peer companies. And in anticipation of the shifting expectations, you know, you, you need to think about the various stakeholders who may be looking at your firm or your organization and its exposure to risks. And that could include regulators, the investment community, rating agencies. If you look at Standard and Poor's and Moody's and Fitch and Ambest, many of them are requiring climate uh, stress testing or climate scenarios to be included in order to achieve a rating. You've got your shareholders, uh, market expectations. If you're a mutual organization, you may have your membership to consider. And when you think about what do scenarios really inform, if you look at the right side of this slide, they, they inform many things and that includes the governance of an organization. Uh, you, you know, how do you know, fundamentally boards and, and uh, executives of an organization have a stewardship responsibility to govern that organization in a responsible manner and assess risks and opportunities in order to, to make the firm successful. That informs the strategy that, that, say, a firm would employ. And in order to have a successful strategy, you have to manage risks, and that usually means measurement and targets for things that are measured tend to get managed. So actuaries are heavily involved in all of these things. And we play an important role in helping the, the, the uh, assessment of risk from climate. This graphic provides a, a sort of schematic view uh, of what scenario, uh, scenario analysis does. And, and we'll talk about sort of three things here. So I guess the first is, is up in the orange um, ovals. Up, up in the upper left, we, we kind of talk about identifying potential exposures to climate related risks. And that would look at, you know, transmission channels uh, that would, you know, identify climate related risks where, you, you know, Philip talked about the various RCP scenarios. So we would start with some, um, some scenarios looking at the various climate pathways. And then how, and we would understand how uh, assets or firms or, or other uh, financial things are, are exposed to, uh, to those climate risks. We then would go to the green ovals and uh, consider things like the socioeconomic context of, of the country uh, it, 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 or, or the, the local region. Uh, you know, how dependent is that region on various fossil fuel activities? How easy is it for that, that region to transition to other types of, um, of, uh, of fuel? How, uh, how easy can that uh, region adapt and uh, mitigate against uh, climate related risks? Can it, uh, you know, is it heavily exposed like a place like Bangladesh to sea level rise, et cetera? The technology is very important, and it's probably one of the, the, the more forgotten components of scenario analysis that we, we often think about technology in the present and, and fail to think about 
how technology may revolutionize things. I mean, look at this webinar we're holding uh, today. Uh, you know, Zoom was barely uh, on people's radar a few years ago, and, and we have a pandemic, and now everybody's commonly using Zoom. That's an example of a technological evolution that may have occurred a lot faster than people think. That you then have uh, the policy landscape and, you know, emission uh, pathways. Once you, you kind of understand how those things are going to affect the future, then the challenge becomes to quantify that in, in some sort of financial impact or, or to put, you know, sort of dollars and numbers um, around those potential future outcomes and how they're going to affect a particular firm. So you would then define various risk measures. You'd choose uh, assessment tools and then use those tools to assess the, the impacts on your organization potentially and then map out actions that could either mitigate risk or take advantage of opportunities. So when we talk about kind of what a climate scenario is, there's, there's a few things to, to really remember. You know, first of all, we, we say it's a, a projection, not a prediction. You know, we, 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 we can't really predict uh, with any certainty what's going to happen 10, 20, or 50 years from now. But instead, we look at what plausibly could happen. And that requires us often to have several views of the future and several scenarios that we construct about potential futures. And, and then we have to find a way to integrate those into, into some sort of framework to understand the potential outcomes that could face us in the future. Um, they're also not intended to be a full description of the future. Instead, they're, they're meant to be, you know, what are the key things that are relevant to the organization, the country, the, the firm, which is developing the scenario. Um, you might have a very different scenario, say for um, a portfolio, uh, say a, a mortgage portfolio of coastal properties than you might have for a shipping company or something. Um, you know, you also, uh, you know, can use scenarios to sort of think through and, and, and think about the potential impacts of climate change on, on various parts of an organization. Um, they're, they're, they're really a way to think about a journey. They're not really an endpoint. And that's important when you an analyze scenarios that you have to constantly check them as you move forward in time to make sure that you know, the scenario is on track. You can't simply develop a scenario for 2030 and forget about it until 2029. You need to really be looking at the path, mapping out what's gonna to happen to get you to 2030 and 2022, 2024, 2026, and then try to understand you know, whether or not you're actually on that pathway as you move forward. Uh, so, so that it's really important to understand that you need to really understand that there's quite a bit of uncertainty around designing scenarios, and that means you really want to have a, a robust uh, understanding of that uncertainty, and that's a place that actuaries uh, can add quite a lot of value because we are experts in uncertainty. And we also think stochastically so we can integrate, you know, multiple future uh, states and and put them into a cohesive framework. So when there's you know there, while there is a lot of certainty that if you go forward to a point in time that certain things will occur, it's important to understand that the timing and of those things is quite unpredictable. And I'd say particularly with regard to transition risks because those can be. Uh, dependent upon government actions. Uh, you know, we had in Australia where I live, we, get, we had a situation where there was a carbon tax in place and a change in government, and the next day there was no carbon tax. Uh, they repealed it. So you, you can have significant changes in, in uh, situations and scenarios based upon highly volatile events. And, and, and so I, I think that, you know, you've got to understand that you've got a combination of physical effects that tend to be much slower, more inexorable. Um, and, and while there is some uncertainty, it tends to be um, a, a much more, more slow process. And then you've also got, you know, decisions by many stakeholders, including governments, institutions, entities, and, and individuals. And, and importantly, as I mentioned before, technological changes are important, as are the feedback loops that, 
Philip mentioned. So in order to really think through all this, you need a structured set of scenarios that can capture uh, these type of uncertainties. So when we talk about the desirable characteristics of scenarios, uh, we use terms like plausible. I mean, obviously it has to be something that could happen. Uh, we want scenarios to be distinctive so that, so that you know, various scenarios are, are different from one another, but they need to be internally consistent, relevant to the situation, organization, or country that they're being projected for. They, they should be challenging. They, they should you know, not assume business as usual and, and, and assume that you will stress your organization in ways that can help inform uh, strategies and risk management metrics. And it also should be transparent in the sense that your scenario should be constructed in a way that you can document them and, and make them clear to various stakeholders. And, and so they need to not only look at one scenario that you think is likely, but also a range of scenarios that would actually stress the organization or, or firm or, or entity um, in ways that would help in identify potential vulnerabilities. And you use this to basically understand impacts on the enterprise, its value chain, and also its supply chains and the, importantly, understand both risks and opportunities that you may face in the future and to test the resilience of the system to extreme scenarios. So when we think about the desirable characteristics of scenarios, we, we tend to have a, a couple of key elements. There needs to be some sort of uh, emissions pathway as Philip covered. There needs to be some kind of socioeconomic context which talks about not only the effect of those RCP scenarios on a, an economy or, or a social system, but also um, you know, how that social system may react in terms of decarbonization, adaptation, mitigation, et cetera. You have to consider the technology and you have to consider the, the policies that are enacted by uh, governments such as a carbon tax or through um, or, or through perhaps non-governmental policy uh, actions. For example, it could also be things that are enacted uh, outside of your country. So, you know, the various countries have been talking about putting carbon tariffs on, um, on imports from countries that have high carbon emissions. Um, that's something that's not in the control perhaps of your national government, but of, 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 of another country that you trade with. On the right, we, we also have an important concept of the orderly transition and the disorderly transition. In, in an orderly transition, which is, is actuaries and planners, most of us would favor, we, we would do things in a, in a, in a you know, orderly fashion with good planning and, and it would be done over time, et cetera. Um, but you know, there also is a possibility of a disorderly transition where we do nothing until 2030 or 2035 and they have to abruptly shift to a much more draconian um, uh, situation of reducing emissions in order to hit targets. And then we also not only have to consider the, the, the uh, orderly disorderly dimension, but we also have to consider, um, you know, what happens if we do or do not um, hit our targets. So it's important as you think about this as actuaries that you consider the interaction between various components of a scenario. As, as we said earlier, we start with an emissions pathway. That emissions pathway will then interact with the socioeconomic context of, of, of the uh, various countries and economies. How well can they tolerate climate change? How do uh, countries interact with one another and so forth? Uh, you know, how are countries going to uh, act? Will they act together under a, you know, like the, the, the Paris Agreement or in a cooperative fashion? Or will they act in a, in a hostile faction, fashion with perhaps climate tariffs or trade wars? Uh, will, how will technological changes affect things? Uh, an example there is, um, you know, if we're going to assume electrification of the vehicle fleet, we may have to assume advances in battery technology, uh, charging stations, uh, and other things that would support electrification of the vehicle fleet. When you think about, um, you know, what do you do now to actually put this into practice, 
Um, you need to think about variables as act actuaries. We build models, we put variables in them. And, and this graphic, which I won't read, list is, lists a number of variables, including physical things like temperatures, agricultural productivity. You then have transition variables like carbon prices, um, you know, how are commodity prices going to change? How will that influence the mixture of renewable and, and uh, transition energies like gas? Uh, you, you've also then got, you know, macroeconomic variables like GDP, unemployment, income, et cetera, which then translates into other financial market variables, et cetera. For each scenario you construct, these type of variables can be estimated and then integrated into financial models that help inform decision making. As you try to implement these things, there is a lot of resources out there. But uh, I think you'll find that there is no, as of today, um, you know, one-stop shop where you can get all the scenarios you need for your organization. Um, you, you certainly um, can find a number of scenarios. There's, there's uh, physical risk scenarios. The Australian uh, Climate Measurement Standards Initiative, uh, CMSI, is something you could Google that's a, a useful example of that. And, and, you know, you need to consider when you look at scenarios, you, you know, how, how, much, um, how much depth do you need? How relevant are they for your uh, organization, et cetera? And, you know, you can start with some, some general scenarios and then customize them um, to fit the needs of the application. Uh, kind of last point I'd kind of make here is that the you know, the enter enterprise's control of the outcome is limited. You know, you, you operate in a, in a company or a firm or an organization. Um, it's, it's, it, it's difficult for the organizations unless you're an enormous, uh, you know, global organization to really have a long-term effect on some of these um, decisions. So, you know, at least in the physical case, you know, many of the physical risks are baked in the, the things that will happen in the weather in 2025 uh, reflect carbon emissions 10, 20 years ago. And, and so, you know, some of these things are, are going to, you know, sort of play out almost no matter what we do. Uh, the transition risks um, are, on the other hand, can, can be significantly affected by good planning, et cetera. And, and it's important for you to understand, you know, which things may, may the organization or the country be able to influence, which may not, and how the various uh, risks for physical and transition interact both now and over a long time horizon of 20 years or mid-century. And with that, I will turn it back to Micheline to uh, wrap up. Next slide, please, so Ray, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed the presentation. As we get to final slides, I would like to go over the key challenges with you. Uh, first, that we're talking far-reaching impact. It's rare that we use scenario with so many variables, so many interconnections, and the possibility of such dramatic outcome. So yes, indeed, it's uh, breadth and magnitude is, is, is important. Dependency on short-term actions, there's transition and tipping points. It has it will take concerted efforts to be effective and there will be a lot of uncertainty of what to well, what will ever occur cognitive bias we have not talked necessarily a lot about that so far but uh, basically what is happening there is we often use our judgment to assess result reasonableness of results and, and the problem is that our prior experiences are not likely to be relevant and should, we should remain conscious of it as we're getting into a brand new world. Data gaps, of course, there's big data gaps and lots of uh, work that will be done in, in the future years to understand more what's going on. So hopefully gaps will uh, get uh, smaller over time, but right now, effectively, uh, as, as we go to guest work, we have to, uh, to replace data, we have to, uh, be cognition of that uh, cognitive bias that we just talked about. 
And then comparability of disclosure, uh, we've heard about that already. Uh, it, there's numerous pathways and interaction and data gaps are very difficult to compare and to figure out where one is compared to its neighbor. And there are other risks that we are, uh, are related, but often off the radar, like biodiversity. It is far from obvious to assess trade-offs if and when such trade-off will be needed. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's there's a final one. Just that's I would say the fly, slide forty two. I think. Yes. Uh, this is uh, back to the papers that we um, still have to do. Uh, so it's I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, just to remind you that there's uh, way more to come, and that uh, so it's. We don't have yet all the answers. Uh, and then that being said, we'll go to the question period. And I, uh, we already have a, a few questions that have come in. If you want to uh, ask questions, we, have, we don't have much time left, uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's go with what we have. Um, first question from Louis Doiron. I have some regulators in the world already set new risk and capital requirements. Uh, I'll right, start wanna... perhaps. Yeah, I, I'll start. Um, I, I can speak for um, the region I'm I'm in. Um, I'm not aware yet that uh, the countries in this region have started explicitly changing those requirements. However, uh, regulators like APRA in Australia and other countries have talked about introducing stress tests and prudential guidance in 2021 and, and in the next coming years on that. I, I would note that I think the initial uh, 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 push in that area is probably coming more from shareholders and rating agencies than regulators. Although certainly in, in countries in Europe and the UK, the, in Australia, they're, they're certainly inching in that direction um, and getting there quite, quite soon, I think. Philip, you want to add something to this? Uh, yeah, I don't know if any regulator has already introduced it, but I know what is confidential of one regulator in, in my region who is considering to do that in the coming years. But it's, of course, highly complex to do it. Also, how do you do a one year capital requirement for risks that will emanate over many years? And, and, I, and I think one other, I was going to say one other problem that I think we have that has to be solved first, uh, Philip, is that, you know, there needs to be, I think, some general agreement on how do you translate a, you know, RCP scenario into specific effects in a country from physical risk. You know, what, what standards are you going to use, for example? Are you going to, if you're looking at insurance portfolio, do you hold the assets constant and then stress it in the future for climate? Or do you try to both look at the change in the asset portfolio, like, you know, buildings in addition to the change in the climate? So there's, there's quite a lot of things that have to be worked out technically before you can start putting those kind of regulations in. I agree. What I understand is so what the, is being done often is there are going to be surveys as to what's happening in the in the in the industry, and so they are the, at the point more of trying to find out w what's the status and the, what the the companies are doing rather than imposing a, a requirement at this point. So uh, I know it's 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 like that in Canada, but I I'm, I'm understanding it's like uh, UK also had done uh, some surveys yeah. and so. Yeah, that seems to be the, the first reaction here. So we have another question uh, from Andre Choquet. Uh, carbon tax will not only affect GHG uh, emitting companies, but potentially all areas of the economy. Where would you integrate political decisions on timing and the level of ca carbon tax in climate scenarios? Ooh. Philip, why don't you try that one first? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. Nope. 
All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. I, I, I think the carbon taxes are something which economists love and politicians hate. And it's 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 a you know it's it's one of those things that if you talk to any economist they say it's the most efficient way. I was at a seminar today as an as an example a few hours ago, where um, you know one of the leading economists in Australia said you know our GDP would be much higher today if we'd implemented a carbon tax ten years ago, and the problem is that the government that implemented it got voted out, and. <laughs> So, so I, I, I tend to not look at things like carbon taxes in scenarios myself because I think they're politically volatile and I, 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 I tend to, to, to instead look at things personally like, you know, technological changes, you know, the cost of renewable power, things like that, because um, I, I, I think the, you know, political issues with, with carbon tariffs or sorry carbon taxes in many countries are, are pretty extreme at the moment and very hard to predict philip you may disagree in europe but yeah no i, I mean it's just it really depends on where you are i mean how denmark deals with this issue will be very different to brazil or how the u.s deals with it is, is even different in, on a federal level compared to for instance uh, california so it really depends on the area or the politics the government and the current government in power. So I think there is no one way on how to do it. Okay, thank you. Another question from Louis Boiron. Key risks are also the increasing cost of insurance coverage or lack of coverage for significant risks like tsunami, tidal wave. And, uh, and uh, so any comments there? Well, well, certainly uh, the cost of insurance is, uh, you know, there's an old expression and I hate to use it because it talks, it's like a fossil fuel analogy. They used to call about the canary in the coal mine, um, you know, meaning that, you know, that was a leading indicator of, of problems. And, you know, certainly we're seeing insurance premiums being the messenger of bad news in many areas uh, for rising risk. And, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, sometimes, the, the premiums rise, the politicians react and put a pool or some other mechanism in place or rate regulation to suppress the premiums. And, and then the economic signals are muted. But I, but I do think the affordability and availability of insurance, particularly for things like flood in coastal regions, et cetera, is gonna be a huge challenge in, in coming years. Uh, and, and I think that the insurance industry would be wise to get out in front of that problem because it, you know you can't just raise premiums 500% or 1000% and expect um, you know, no reaction in the public. Yeah, I, I think we see the same here uh, in Europe. I mean, it's insurance puts a price on risk and, and that is natural. So, uh, Personally, I think it, it will not be a devastating issue in the developing countries, but for instance, like in India or Bangladesh, where you might expect a devastating heat waves, which will impact people a lot, it might become difficult to insure, even using micro insurance. And so uh, I would hope that one would then find at least some governmental insurance industry pooling, or perhaps even supranational approaches to, so that also, these people who will be affected the worst uh, will still benefit from uh, at least some part of insurance. I, I would like to, Micheline, if I could make one other quick comment. I, I think the one huge area that actuaries can add a lot of value in this discussion is in the area of helping to inform building code decisions. Um, you know, we need to future proof building code and land use decisions. I mean, it is ridiculous if you're building a house that has or a building that has a 50 or 100 year design lifetime that you're not cons and you're putting it on a coastal area that you're not considering uh, sea level rise. That's that's insane. And, you know, that's an area that I think actuaries can add a lot of value by saying, you know, the future insurance costs are going to be unaffordable. We need to do something about that. Um, and that's a huge lift with uh, builders and a lot of the stakeholders that, you know, don't want to see building code standards improved uh, 
Um, but I, I think that's a huge area that will help, uh, you know, reduce the affordability pressures of insurance in the future. And uh, this seems to be a good link to uh, a Ralph Blanchard question about the uh, fact that, uh, well, we'll read it. Seems like the focus for long duration business is to include current contracts, while the short duration business, the focus is on strategic planning as opposed to current balance sheet. And I guess you're building code and things like that. The formula sounds like one of those strategic planning uh, in terms of action to, uh, to um, uh, if you're more realistic about the risk, you will force people to have uh, like better building codes and things like that in a way. Uh, your comments. Well, Ralph, good question. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think that that if you think about the insurance industry and the actuaries, we, we a lot of what we're going to be dealing with is probably balance sheet issues, if that's what you were kind of getting at in the sense that, you know, divestment of carbon assets and um, and various uh, trans reactions to transition uh, decarbonization, electrification of vehicles, you know, uh, decarbonizing supply chains, you know, a lot of those things are, are within the planning horizons of companies, whereas a lot of the, you know, physical risk stuff is decades in the future and, and quite long term. And of course, with, you know, short term policies for insurance companies, you, you, you generally can adjust your pricing and underwriting over time to, to solve that problem. So, you know, so I, I do think that, you know, the transition risk is probably the more important thing to think about. Okay, thank you very much. I noticed that the time is, is going by, uh, that we're basically seven minutes past the, 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 our time. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions that you've given us. I've seen that some are basically suggesting that we do more work at the IAA to help out. So we're going to take note of that, uh, no more comment on on that at this point. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to Ray and Philip for the, for the great uh, presentation that you've done. And uh, hopefully we'll keep, um, keep us in mind there are few, for more papers to come. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting times and we're glad you're uh, also excited about that uh, topic. Thanks. <laughs>